Welcome to our short webinar on meal amino acids and soybean value. I'm Nick Bajalia, and in the next 15 minutes, we're going to run through a number of topics relevant to soybean value with a particular focus on meal. Now, typically, meal represents a greater proportion of total product value than does oil. And one might say, well, how can that be when we know that oil is much more valuable per pound than meal is? And the reason is, is that a bushel of soybeans produces approximately four times more meal than it does oil. And so until we have a situation where the price per pound of oil is four times that of a pound of meal, meal will always represent a greater proportion of total value. Now, soy meal is used primarily as an ingredient in animal feeds. And in this application, poultry and swine represent over 75% of total usage. Soybean meal finds usage in feeds because it complements the nutrient characteristics of other feed ingredients and enables nutritionists to achieve targeted nutrient levels in the final feed. Growing in poultry and swine have a dietary need for specific amino acids, not crude proteins. As you know, proteins are built by linking amino acids into a chain, and different proteins have different amino acid sequences, different levels of individual amino acids, and different biological functions. Now, crude protein, which has been the measurement that we have historically used, is based upon nitrogen content. It was utilized because it was relatively easy to measure. And you calculate crude protein by multiplying nitrogen level by a factor of 6.25, which is a typical factor, although others exist. Unfortunately, crude protein by itself is an inadequate descriptor of nutritional value. And with the evolution of improved measurement tools, nutritionists have moved away from using crude protein in the formulations to the use of amino acids. And even now, we're moving away from total amino acids to digestible amino acids. Nutritionists use soybean meal to provide limiting amino acids to poultry and swine. In domestic feeds, corn is typically the major ingredient, but by itself, Corn is, is deficient in amino acids required for optimal health and animal growth. The chart on this slide identifies the level of amino acids provided by corn in blue and compares that to the level required by a growing young pig. And as you can tell, in all cases, corn by itself would be deficient. Now, over the past 50 years, soy meal has served as a primary source of the supplemental amino acids needed to achieve amino acid levels in the final feed in corn-based diets. Now, whilst the amino acid characteristics of soy meal are the primary driver of utilization, other characteristics in soy meal represent tag-along value, and these include nutritionally available energy, minerals, and vitamins. Now, the combination of all these nutritional characteristics represents soybean meal's nutritional bundle. Now, with the nutritional bundle, there are multiple considerations, and these tend to complicate the assessment of value as well as evaluation of opportunity. But one of the things to realize is that relatively small shifts in multiple characteristics can add up to meaningful changes in value. Now, this represents an opportunity or a peril depending on whether and how these differences are managed. Now, a product's value proposition is the sum of all of its characteristics relative to price. And in the case of soybean meal, in addition to the meal's nutritional bundle, there are other considerations that factor into how the customer ends up evaluating the value and usage level of our product. One thing that we must constantly keep in mind is that soy meal must compete for usage with alternate sources of the nutrients it provides. Every one of the nutrients in soy meal can provi be provided by another source. Now, the usage of soy meal at a given price is dependent upon its value proposition relative to the other ingredients that it must compete with. And these relationships are constantly changing depending upon the particular customer and uh, their own set of needs, as well as their own set and values for other competitive ingredients. And ultimately, the end user determines, based upon this mix of information, how much soy meal to utilize and at what price they're willing to pay for it.
Now, in a competitive setting, a product will either improve or diminish, and we are currently in a very competitive setting. And this brings us to the composition opportunity. The best way to tie your relationship to your customers in the case of a product such as soybean meal is based upon the characteristics of your product, and in particular, its composition, which is the basis for its utilization. Now, the composition opportunity is going to be dependent upon the extent to which differences in soybean composition exist, the economic value associated with compositional differences, and probably even more importantly, the extent to which the pursuit of these opportunities is feasible within the content of market systems and tools needed to uh, measure them. USB has taken a comprehensive approach to the soybean composition opportunity. In the case of meal, that began in the late 90s with the protein users forum process in which we engaged industry nutritionists in helping us identify targets for improvement. Then the next part of the process was we, we went in there and um, looked at the extent to which composition varied in soybeans. If there's no variation in, in soybean composition, there's little opportunity to improve it without going to GM types of technologies. And what we found was that there was a whole lot more compositional variation relative to amino acid levels than what many had in the past believed to exist. So this represented an opportunity for moving forward. But one of the barriers we had then was the ability to measure these differences in a cost and time effective manner. And this led to a subsequent project where we evaluated the use of NR tools for analyzing amino acid levels in soybeans. And as part of this process, we ultimately engaged the NR instrument manufacturers, several of those in a project that helped confirm that we could use this as a tool for amino acids, and at the same time, we developed and improved upon the calibrations that were required. We next wanted to explore the extent to which we might be able to further improve the product by looking at exotic materials in the USDA germplasm collection. And one of the questions that kept coming up was, what is the impact of environment? So we had a side study where we looked at the impact of environment and genetics on protein quality. Another issue that had to be addressed is, what does our existing crop look like? If you want to improve something, engage that improvement, you have to be able to find your starting point. And so we contracted with NAS and used some samples from their objective yield sample set for um, evaluating the extent to which we had compositional variation in our existing crop. And it's due to some limitations in that sample set relative to understanding genetics and yield, we have subsequently evaluate the first samples for amino acids, and this sample set allows us to not only uh, identify varieties by number, but also look at um, yield as well as the uh, agronomic characteristics under which they're growing. And then finally, through the course of time, we've had the Animal Nutrition Working Group, which is a subset of industry nutritionists, evaluate what we've been doing and provide guidance, and one of the things that they've helped us on is the evaluation of reduced raffinosaccharide soybeans, which have a tag-along trait of greater nutritional energy, and therefore this is another option for adding value. Now, all of our work so far has been done with soybeans, and obviously soybeans must be processed into meal, and the composition of the meal is going to be a function of both the soybean composition as well as the processing and handling parameters. Now, the reason we've worked with soybeans at this point is that to affect beneficial change, we must focus on the most basic unit. And farmers grow soybeans, plant breeders breed soybeans, and this is where we've, we've targeted most of our efforts. However, when you talk to nutritionists, they're not interested in soybean composition. They're interested in soybean meal composition. And so to take our soybean composition values and put them in a meal perspective, we have developed and employed models that accomplish that. Now, the point of this slide presented here for you to pause if you're interested, it has some comments about models and their use, but the thing to always remember about models are that the results they have are estimates, and they should be used to look at situations, but they are estimates and they should be used as such. What I'd like to next do is illustrate the impact of differences in amino acid profile on applied value. And in particular, how multiple small differences, which we talked about earlier, can add up and another consideration is the opportunity or the risk associated with variation and the cost this might represent. And managing that variation represents another opportunity for adding value. To do this, we're going to use a, a subset of the first sample set. And 
the beauty of the first data set is that for each of these regions identified here, there are four locations that have side-by-side -side comparisons of the same varieties. So we can look at things such as yield. We can also do statistics on the results. And this becomes a very powerful set of data to further tease out some of the issues that we need to better understand in this area. And for our evaluation, we're going to focus on results from the Southern Illinois section identified here. This next graphic ranks 58 varieties from that Southern Illinois region. We rank the average values for lysine and lysine only. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of range in lysine value for the, the meal. Now, as a nutritionist viewing this, you know, I can look at the average, and, and someone might say, well, you should use the average value to uh, identify the lysine number for formulating feeds for poultry and swine. But the problem with that is the average value, if I use that, then half the time I know I'm going to be under-formulating my feeds. And when that happens, animals don't perform, and uh, eventually my capabilities as a nutritionist would get questioned. So one of the ways for managing that risk is to take one standard deviation and subtract that from the average value. And then in this case, I'm only going to be deficient approximately 16% of the time, which is by definition how this looks from the standpoint of standard deviation. And so oftentimes it may be one standard deviation, maybe something more, something less. But one of the ways that the industry addresses the risk associated with this variation is by discounting the average value. Now, this slide here identifies the types of differences we're talking about, and um, as you can tell, those differences are quite small. And so what I'd like to do next is use a least cost formulation approach to try and estimate what the economic value differences are associated with soy meal that utilizes average values versus one standard deviation from the average. And to do this, I used both a swine and a broiler diet because this identifies the fact that uh, different applications have different values. And these, were the, uh, these are the prices that we used in formulation. And from the nutrition standpoint, I'm more interested in what cost differences there is per ton of feed. And if you can save a dollar per ton of feed, you're going to be a short-term hero oftentimes. So we have a greater difference here in cost per ton of feed by between the average and the average minus one standard deviation. Now, if you extrapolate that to meal value, we have some pretty considerable differences in value for that meal. That would be the amount of money that would be at play if the uh, standard deviation approach was used as opposed to formulating for the average. I'd just like to share a few uh, additional observations that have consistently been shown through the last several years with the first sample sets. One is that composition does vary significantly by entry or, or variety. And the implication here is that we can improve composition through plant selection. Another observation we've consistently seen is that end user relevant compositional variation exists in commercial lines. And the implication here is that near term benefit can be achieved. We don't have to wait five to seven years for a plant breeding program. And another relationship that has been consistently observed is that the relationship between yield and compositional characteristics tends to be weak. And the implication here is that we can improve composition without impacting yield. Well, thank you very much for your interest and time.